uh, I will mainly uh, talk about sell out. This is me when I was around six, seven years old, the very first time I got my hands on a computer. And ever since I've been playing and working and experimenting with computers and eventually went to art school. And in art school I decided and I um, uh, came to the conclusion that I want to be an artist and I want to be an artist that uses the computer and the internet to show how these devices and how these networks uh, shape our culture. That's my main focus in my art practice. Um, the project I'm going to talk about is of course Sellout, which you see here and inside of this room. For Sellout I put my entire genome online for, in an auction for one year, so everybody could place a bid to the, through the website sellout.me. And in the end of the year, uh, whoever has the highest bid would be the new owner of my complete DNA uh, data. And, and why not begin at the very, very last moment of this auction, which is the last more or less 30 seconds. I have a video of, we're gonna watch a clip of this, these last 30 seconds in my studio. Uh, and here I'm receiving the last bids after this entire year uh, of the people who want to buy the artwork. Is it safe here? Yeah. So, um, the funny thing is that this harsh black cut of a fade to black, um, I didn't design it, I didn't create it. It was the battery that was empty at the exact moment when the clock hit 12 o'clock. So there's some kind of symbolic value in it, I'm not sure. But it, I couldn't have think of a, a thought of a better way to end this short clip. Um, and the last, in the last four, four or five minutes, there were four parties who actually uh, were placing bids on my DNA data. And eventually the Verbeke Foundation had the highest bid of 1,100 euros. And now I want to take you back to the beginning of the project, the, the reason why I started this project and why I thought that selling my own DNA data would be a good or interesting idea. And it was, it was inspired by this quote from Nelly Cruz wrote, who said in a, in a presentation, in short, ladies and gentlemen, my message today is that data is gold. And I think for now it's a very, very famous saying that data is a new gold or data is a new oil or however you want to call it. Um, and I was, th I was thinking if data is really the new gold, then I, of course, own also a lot of personal data my genome, my DNA data. So if data is gold, then my own DNA data is worth also something. And that was the main question that I wanted to address with this uh, artwork sellout. The other uh, inspiration was services like 23andMe.com in which you can quite cheaply sequence your own DNA, not your full genome, but the most important parts. And then 23andMe.com will sequence your DNA, it will give you access through a database and then from, from their website you can see what the results are from that sequencing. For example, you can see what the chances are that you will get um, one of these diseases. So sequencing DNA is becoming more easier and more cheaper and more widely available. Also through these hardware inventions, the Nanopore, the Minion, it's a very small USB DNA sequence device. And if you look at the costs from DNA sequencing, it also shows you that it will become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So now we're at the point that a full genome can be sequenced for, I think, almost uh, around 1,000 euros. And you can see how expensive it was uh, 10 years ago. So DNA becomes data, uh, just like all these other forms of content like music, cinema, money, uh, books, all these forms of entertainment, all these forms of content have become eventually binary code. And when these become data, when these become binary code, it's my opinion that all sorts of 
the same questions pop up, mainly about piracy, privacy, copyright, authorship, uh, remix culture. Uh, content becomes very cheap. Content can be distributed way more easy than, uh, than before. And we see this also in places that we don't really perhaps want to see. For example, credit card information is, is being sold on the dark web. We don't really want it to happen, but it happens. Because, in my opinion, these, this information has become binary code, and binary code just fl takes the easiest route on the internet. We, we, it, it becomes very difficult for us to hold or grasp or, or, or to control binary code online. So, and my idea was that uh, as sequencing, DNA sequencing technology is becoming more cheaper, more widely available, and more faster and easier, this will also happen to DNA data. So also DNA data will be uploaded to the internet, sold and bought and downloaded and perhaps remixed and leaked and hacked and so on and so on and so on. So the main question that then pops up is, uh, who is the owner of this DNA data? And this is uh, my DNA data, the same data you see in the server cabinet. And what you see here is CRH1, which stands for chromosome one, and we all have multiple chromosomes. Then you see a position, um, and then you see an A, T, C, or G. And if you know your, from all your chromosomes, and you know all the positions, and you know if there's an A, T, C, or G, then you have your complete uh, genome, your full genome. And this is around two, 380 gigabytes of, of information, it's just pure, pure text files. Um, and now I, want to, now I want to show you a different side of the project, which is we have the server cabinet, we have the data, and we have the website on which people can place their bids, could place their bids. Um, but there's also a photo series created by the artwork, and also uh, I asked four companies to write me their thoughts on the selling of human DNA data. As we start with the photo series, the first step is, of course, going to a hospital, in this case the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, to actually have your DNA sequenced, and it starts with generating blood samples. From these blood samples, these three blood files, we take out the biological DNA. We don't need all the blood, we just need the, the physical biological DNA. And this is just one of the steps. There are a lot of steps involved in this process. From this biological DNA, we take it and we put it on a small, very small glass plate, and this plate goes inside of the HiSec 2000, this machine behind us. And to sequence an entire genome, a full genome, it takes around two weeks nonstop to create a digital, ver a digital version of my biological DNA. Um, an important thing to say is that my DNA has been sequenced on a 30-fold depth, meaning that you can sequence your DNA uh, once, the machine can read it once and then make a digital copy, but then it can uh, um, have a lot of errors in it. And if you do it a second time, a third time, and a fourth time, these errors will um, get out of the code. So if you do it 30 times, then it's uh, the same quality as the, the people in the laboratory in the Erasmus Medical Center uh, use. And you, can, you could compare it with if you have a, a photo camera. I can make a picture of the audience with a photo, photo camera with one megapixel or a photo camera with uh, 12 megapixels. It's still, still the same audience, but the latter is, of course, way sharper. And after this uh, sequence machine, the data goes into the data center, which is in a different physical location. And the first server cabinet you see here is responsible for both storing the data, uh, DNA data, and analyzing the DNA data. And afterwards, it's checked by the bioinformaticians who check the quality of the DNA data. And the last step is, of course, that the DNA data is transferred from the data center into the server cabinet into the gallery. And you can see on top of the screen which shows the website of sellout.me, which shows the real-time uh, current bid on the project, when it was still uh, possible to place a bid, and the bottom screen shows the actual DNA code. I calculated how long it would take if you wanted to see all the DNA data uh, once, and with this speed, which you can show and see in the, in the server cabinet, it will take approximately 17 years for the whole machine to run nonstop 
if you want to see all your chromosomes and all the positions and all the data. Uh, so in all the exhibitions that this work has been, it has never surpassed the first chromosome. So until now, nobody has actually saw chromosome two of my DNA. <laughs> so the process started. When the process started, two very important questions came to mind for me as the, as the, as the, as the creator of the artwork, which was, of course, one, uh, what am I doing? Because it's quite a privacy breach to sell my own DNA. Uh, and I was going to fix that in the very first stages of the project by adding a contract to the artwork. And I, start, I thought, whoever buys it, they have to sign a contract. And in the contract uh, states what the owner can and cannot do with my DNA data. Um, I was, for example, I was afraid that if they analyze my DNA data and they know, for example, what my chances are on getting Alzheimer's disease, they can put it online and also um, my parents can read it. And of course, this is the interesting thing with DNA data and where it differs from, for example, credit card information or Facebook data. The DNA data is really a bloodline uh, data type. So. This is my data, my personal uh, DNA data, but also half of it is, of course, from my son. And my parents are in there some, somewhere. My sister is also in there somewhere. So everything I do with my DNA data, uh, you could ask yourself if, if I'm even allowed to do it. Is it my data to sell? Or is it just uh, the data I got from my parents since they created my genome? Um, and if I sell it, is it my money or is it the money for also my sister and also my, my, my son and my parents and my grandma and so on and so on? So it's a quite a difficult um, uh, conversation. Um, the other one, the other question that, that popped up was that I, I became quite scared that somebody would buy the whole art installation, whole artwork for like, let's say, 10 euros. That nobody would place a bid the entire year. And that in the end of the year, somebody would place a bit of 10 or 12 euros and they bought the whole art installation. So I thought, yeah, the, the, I won't start at zero euros. I will start at the production price of the artwork. That's the way a normal product uh, should be sold. It should be sold, it should, should be sold at least uh, for the production price. And I was talking with some fellow friends and they also told me yeah, all these things, these putting up the production price and adding a contract, uh, you're just scared. It's not the best way to present the artwork. It's not the best way to ask the fundamental question, uh, what happens if you sell DNA data, if you auction the DNA data? So of course, it doesn't really matter what the production price is. It matters what people uh, would want to give for a human DNA profile. So I decided not to add a contract and I decided not to use the production price as a starting point of the, for the auction. It just started at zero euros. And the next thing I did, because these question, the questions popped up in my mind and I didn't really have the, the right answers, I also asked four companies to write me a, a letter or a short, short essay. Uh, and I asked them, how do you look as, as professionals, how do you look at the selling of human DNA data? So I asked Christie's from an art perspective, Erasmus Medical Center from a medical ethical perspective, KPMG from a financial big data perspective, and Fox IT, which is a cybersecurity firm in the Netherlands, from a cybercrime perspective. And in my opinion, these four texts, which you can uh, see online on the website, but also uh, at the back of the room, uh, these four texts are perhaps maybe 40 or 50% of the whole artwork, because th these texts really give uh, give you a context on the discourse surrounding the selling of human DNA data. So I want to show you a few of these quotes from these texts. And the first one is from uh, Eline Bunnik, who is the ethical uh, uh, advisor at the Erasmus Medical Center. And one of the things she writes, how does one express the moral value of DNA? Can it be converted to a monetary unit? And could we possibly conceive of something like a moral selling price in relation to the cost price, which is the very fundamental question of the whole artwork, because how do you come up uh, with a price if you discard the production price? What makes my DNA uh, more valuable or less valuable than, than your DNA? How do we decide that? The other thing that she writes is when we ask questions about the moral value of our DNA, 
what kind of questions are we talking about? She says uh, there are at least three kind of values. The informative value, so what kind of information can we extract from our uh, genome? And we saw the example of 23andMe.com, a firm which shows you what are the chances for getting Alzheimer's and so on and so on. Uh, the worthiness of protection is a value. So how much do we want to protect our genome and our information from somebody else? And the symbolic value. And this is the symbolic value is actually really interesting because she uh, compares the symbolic value of DNA to the symbolic value of, let's say, uh, your very first toy or your very first uh, long hair which you cut, or the ring you got from your boyfriend or girlfriend, that your DNA could have some sort of symbolic value. That maybe in the future, uh, instead of taking a photograph, we can sequence our DNA and we can hand over our DNA to somebody else and you say, this is my DNA, uh, you get this DNA instead of a photograph, which is kind of interesting. The next one is from Sander Klaus and Nart Wielaert from KPMG, the financial big data company. And they write at the very first top of the, uh, the, the letter, Jeroen Verloon's DNA profile has no monetary value at this moment. It will only be valuable if Jeroen finds a way to get another 100,000 people or even more to offer their DNA profiles for sale. Because they argue that if you have one profile uh, from one single human being, uh, how, how will you know if it's worth anything? You need more profiles, then you can compare the profile you bought and see if it's any good or not. And the second thing they write is, uh, and this is purely from a financial perspective, if you leave out all the moral and ethical questions, the value of your DNA then depends on the following question. Do you know how much your DNA deviates from the average profile? And they write profiles without any important deviations as well as profiles with very unique deviations are likely, likely to be worthless. So if you have a DNA profile which is super average or super unique, then from a financial perspective, uh, it will be very hard for a company to make money off your profile because you're way too average or you're way too unique. You have to be somewhere in the middle and then your DNA profile could uh, yeah, potentially uh, be worth something. Uh, Pim Volkers from Fox IT writes, if the value of our DNA data is not clear at when we sell or hand it over, we could end up like the farmer who sells his ground for a small profit and is then forced to watch as the, as the gold is mined from those grounds. Uh, which is a very relevant case he, he's trying to make because what we know uh, about DNA today might differ of what we know about DNA in five or 10 years. So let's say we'll all uh, agree that some part of our DNA is super important and can be, is relevant to, uh, for diseases or to curing diseases or whatnot. Uh, maybe in five or 10 years, more research has been done and the research shows that we were um, incorrect. Then what we know today about DNA information, what we can extract uh, from, the, from a genome differs in the future. So you never really quite know uh, what's inside your DNA because it changes with the current scientists and current scientific discoveries. And another point he, he's trying to make is, why is Google interested in DNA profiles? Uh, 23andMe.com is a company from one of the wives, from one of the owners and starters from Google. What can we gather from these profiles now and in the future? And would you want to publicly know the sequence of dangerous viruses? Could they be spread by a drone? And especially the, the first quote is now more and more relevant as we have heard of all the things that have been going on with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. So you can imagine that if we have also DNA profiles of some uh, of, of people and we can combine it with social profiles and other profiles, we know even more about people. And then we come to the last perspective from Christie's, Peter van der Graaf. He's an art appraiser and he's, he writes, an art appraiser always works from a historical perspective. Who made the thing I see? When was this work of art made? What is the artist's track record? What is the work's history? And does this history add value? And in this letter, he comes to the conclusion that all these questions are quite problematic uh, because a human DNA profile has never been sold before. DNA profiles have been exchanged within medical institutions or hospitals or research institutions, but there's never been a case where 
a single person offers their complete genome for sale to another single person. So there's no, uh, you can compare it uh, to, another, to a different uh, artist. But he writes, what is the value of human influence DNA? As I've said before, past results are no guarantee for the future, but if financial value can be attributed to Pierre Manzoni's excrements, at what price will Jeroen van Loons in his entirety sell? And Pierre Manzoni was an artist who, um, among others, canned his own feces with the idea everything I make as an artist is, 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 is fantastic, is, 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 is uh, worth something. And uh, he, being, he, was, he ended up being right because I think in, in the 2000s, Christie sold his canned feces for around $200,000 per piece uh, after his death. That's an important uh, note. Um, but you all, you all, of course, know now what my DNA is worth. My DNA is worth 1,100 euros. It's been sold for 1,100 euros to the Fabeca Foundation. This is a close-up of the very last moments, which you just saw in the video. And normally, I end the talk by, by this slide, showing the, the, the price the work is bought for. But last year, I wrote a small article for the DigiMag journal, number 75, called Digital Identities and Self-Narratives. And I reflected on uh, the last month of the project, and uh, more uh, specifically on how I dealt with uh, the, the price of the work. And a few things I wrote in the article, uh, which is shown here right now, are apparently I equated successful art, artwork with expensive artwork. And the funny thing was, I noticed that when, during this, this, during this whole year, that a lot of people came to me and said, Jeroen, but you should, you, you should just place your own bids, nobody will know, and then the price will go up. And even when I talked to journalists about this work, uh, a few of them said, literally to me, yeah, it's interesting, uh, but give me a call when it's really high, then we'll write about it. And I was kind of frustrated by the fact that they wouldn't write about the work because I thought it's super interesting. It, is, it, tells a lot of, it gives you a lot of new questions uh, for the future, for a relevant future, but you're not wanna, you don't want to write about it because the price is not high enough. But then at the very last week or so, uh, when, uh, when the whole project came, almost came to a conclusion, I started feeling the same uh, things um, by myself. So I thought, yeah, but what if, it's a, what if it's a failure? What if the work will be sold for 500 euros or 600 euros or 1,100 euros? When will it be a good work? And it's a very strange conclusion that, um, that I try to, to um, come up with a reason why it would be okay for a lower price. And the fact is, of course, and I realized, I realized it after the whole uh, project, project was um, finished, the price doesn't really matter. What matters is the actual action. What matters is that the DNA data has been sold, either for one euro or for 10,000 euro or for a million. It doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is the fact that DNA data has been offered for sale from a pr private person to another private person and that it's been sold. Um, and that, that brings me back to... Um, uh, to the quote, to, to, the, um, to the slide from the art appraiser, from Christie's, who wrote these questions in which how he, how he um, appraises art, that he looks at the history and the context and the, uh, the artist's track record. And all these questions, they are about the context, and not about the product, not about the production. And I think that was the last thing I realized after this project was finished, that it doesn't really matter for how much or how less it's been sold, uh, and what could, could, what, could made it, what could made a difference. Certainly not a different DNA profile. So your DNA profile is more, uh, I think, almost similar to mine uh, compared if I, if I compare my DNA profile with an apple, for example. Um, so the only thing that would differ in the price is the context and, that's, and not the actual DNA code. And that, I think that was my final conclusion, that the context is more important than the actual production or the actual product. So now, if you want to see uh, my DNA being owned by somebody else, you can see it here. Or you can go to Belgium and see it at the Fabeca Foundation, because they are now the complete and uh, full owner of my DNA data. Yes, and that was my, uh, my
my presentation and I hope you enjoyed it. And if there are any more questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you.